Qatar is an extremely hot and barren desert country. With only oil and natural gas, it is the world's richest country. It is 200 times smaller than the DRC, yet Congo, which too has oil, natural gas and literally every natural resource imaginable to man, is the opposite to Qatar in terms of wealth. On the land of the Congo people lie huge deposits of diamond, gold, copper, cobalt, coltan, uranium and many other minerals. The recent growth of electric vehicles and consumer electronics has driven the demand for cobalt and coltan, making these minerals the new oil. Did you know that the uranium the US used to make the bombs they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from the mines in the DRC? Not to forget an endless supply of water from the Congo River, which is the second largest in the world. The huge Congo forest providing limitless timber and good climate for agriculture. Surely, these natural resources should make the DRC the wealthiest country in the world. But this is not the case. Why? The Congo's mineral wealth is a freak of nature. Now imagine the cell phone in your pocket is part of the problem. Armed groups fighting the deadliest war since World War II are funded through the trade of high-value minerals that tech companies use in our phones, video games, and laptop computers. To answer this question, we must go back 600 years when the Portuguese set foot in what is known as the DRC. Up to the 15th century, the people of Congo had a vast empire that was called the Kingdom of Congo. They ruled vast lands that covered much of West and Central Africa. It was impressive with an advanced level of government and civil service. When the Portuguese sailors arrived in late 15th century, they stumbled on the hugely insane natural resources in the Kingdom of Congo. Rich in resources, they could not believe their eyes. What first attracted the attention were the people. They saw a supply of trade in human flesh. Big, strong, disease-resistant slaves for their plantations in the Americas, Caribbean, and European cities back home. The Portuguese quickly knew that for them to exploit these resources with least resistance, they had to take out the Kingdom of Congo leadership, break up the empire and any local political force capable of upsetting their interests. They did this by creating chaos and anarchy, a template used by future colonizers and countries up to this day. They sent money and modern weapons to rebels of the Congo empire. Kings were killed, Congolese armies defeated and secession tolerated. All this to weaken the empire of the Congolese, to rob their lands and take their sons and daughters into slavery with ease. Within no time, the once mighty empire had broken into anarchy, with villages continuously locked in endless civil wars, just like it is today. Slaves, which were victims of this infighting, were transported in shiploads to be traded in the West. European cities grew rich through the natural resources of Congo and from the trade of the people of Congo. This sad encounter with the Portuguese gave the Congolese a glimpse of what was to follow. Immediately after the Berlin Conference of 1884, the colonialists met to greedily divide Africa amongst themselves. Belgium King Leopold II took over from where the Portuguese left. He made the DRC his own private company, as opposed to what was common among European nations naming it the Congo Free State, supplying rubber majorly for car or bicycle tires and electrical cable insulation. Congolese were forced to work in these rubber plantations, becoming slaves in their own land. Severe punishment including chopping off of hands was met on those who resisted. Millions died. While native Africans suffered and their conditions deteriorated, industrial production in America and Europe thrived, enriching their cities. The population was kept at a low level of development with no education. This suited the colonialists and ensured that when independence came in 1960 in the Congo, there were no African elites to rule the country. Congo was renamed Republic of the Congo on independence from the Belgians. Patrice Lumumba, the country's leader in this moment, was sucked into the Cold War between the USA and Russia. Congo is very rich in minerals like a lot of places in Africa, in particular the uranium, which before 1945 kind of had marginal utility, but as you can imagine after 1945, uranium becomes kind of important to national security interests actually for both the United States and the Soviet Union. So right away, you know, Congo becomes kind of this, this center of, of attention for both the US and the Soviet Union. 
And more, more than just that, I mean, it was in 1959, stepping back a year, where Belgium said to the Congolese, all right, we're giving you your independence next year. When the colonial powers leave, there either leaves a power vacuum, or at least kind of the availability for other influences or even organic leaders to rise up and lead this new country. The Katanga region, that they didn't want to be a part of this new state. They wanted to be independent, separate from the new state of the Congo. And so Lumumba is confronted immediately with having to deal with this and try to keep them in the region because they were especially mineral rich. If Congo was generally, Katanga was really mineral rich. Lumumba looks to the United States and to the UN and says, hey, I need your help to, to kind of bring these guys back in the fold, to kind of crush this rebellion and, and bring Katanga into you know, the actual new state of the Congo. And see, the United States, for their part, was, was, was like, eh, I don't know if I really want, uh, we don't know if we want you to just have complete control over that. Well, Lumumba needed help anyway, so he said, and this is probably his most fatal flaw, as it turns out, he said, well, okay, you guys aren't gonna help me. Let's see if the Soviets will help me. And so immediately, as you can imagine, the United States says, uh-oh, threat. That's a threat if, you know, if this new government is going to, you know, sort of align with the United States, or excuse me, with the Soviet Union, then that's a problem that needs to be rectified. And so to rectify that problem, uh, the CIA, with orders from, uh, from President Eisenhower, sends uh, people and you know, funds operatives within the Congo to capture and to assassinate President Patrice Lumumba of the Congo in January 1961. A new chapter begins in the dark and tragic history of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lumumba following his capture by crack commandos of strongman Colonel Mobutu. Taken to Mobutu's headquarters, past a jeering, threatening crowd, Lumumba was impassive at this lowest ebb of his stormy career. Mobutu watched as his troops manhandled Lumumba, but promised the pro-red Lumumba a fair trial on charges of inciting the army to rebellion. Patrice Lumumba was eventually brutally murdered by European-backed rebels, wary of his leanings to Russia, and Joseph Desire Mobutu took over. President Bush met Thursday with the president of Zaire, Mobutu Sese Seko. The West and America kept him in power and tolerated him as long as he kept the minerals flowing and the Russians blocked from Congo. Mobutu enriched himself and his friends from the wealth of the country and kept the citizens poor in return. The world did not care as long as they got the minerals for cheap. By 1996, Zaire was already a dead state after years of internal strife, dictatorship and economic decline. Rwanda, led by Paul Kagame and supported by Uganda, invaded Zaire with the excuse of flushing out Rwandan exiles and refugees in Congo they believed were perpetrators of the genocide, effectively starting the First Congo War, or what is known as Africa's First World War. Somebody made a very big mistake and ordered whoever did it without order and spent some hours sharing our territory in Changugu and, and killed the people and wounded others, <laughs> that has got its own consequences, of course. In less than a year, no surprise as Mobutu's army was non-existent, underpaid and unfunctional, Kagame defeated Mobutu and installed his puppet Laurent Kabila. Mobutu fled to Morocco, where he died four months later in exile. Laurent Kabila quickly changed the country's name to the Democratic Republic of Congo, once in power. One thing he did not get is the memo to cooperate with Kagame. Once again, Rwanda invaded the DRC, dragging in Uganda, Angola, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, making Congo a mess and a big war zone, or what was known as the Second Congo War. Kabila was assassinated in 2001 by his bodyguards in unclear circumstances and succeeded by his son Joseph Kabila. The next year, Kabila signed a peace accord under which he would share power with former rebels. By 2003, all foreign armies except Rwanda had pulled out of Congo. We are ready to withdraw <coughs> our forces in the context of peace coming to the Congo. If others are as committed as we are, then peace will come. The DRC had a transitional government for three years until 2006, where a first multi-party election was held since independence of 1960. Joseph Kabila won the disputed elections and was sworn in as president. He won another disputed election and was sworn in for a second term on December 2011. 
Protest and violence erupted when Kabila decided to overstay. He eventually called for December 2018 elections and stepped down on January 2019. Felix Shishikedi won and became president to date. The government's and world's inability to provide security in the huge land of Congo created the emergence of more than 100 rebel and militia groups. These armed groups, funded by regional states, the West and China, have made life worse for the citizens of Congo. The militias have killed many people and turned citizens into slaves, digging minerals to fund their armies. The prolonged conflict is a cover for extensive looting of abundant natural resources in the country. Negative ethnicity adds fuel to the fire. As it was when ancestors of the Congolese witnessed Portuguese riders loading boats on the Congo River with their birthright 600 years ago for nothing, same still happens today. Nothing has changed. Trained loads of copper, cobalt, coltan, timber, and many more minerals still move out of mines owned by foreigners to ships heading overseas. It is no secret that a strong state, army, or education system is not the interest of the few elite in Congo or the world. They know that with weak institutions and lazy leadership, plunder without resistance continues. The wealth of the DRC has brought nothing but death and suffering to the people of this great country, only enriching small elite in the Congo and their foreign countries which support them. Thank you for watching. For more educative and informative videos on Africa, Please like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to catch all our latest videos.